Emotions make you dumb. Emotions compromise your ability to think clearly, plan, make decisions. When the emotions take over, how can you still interrupt it no matter where it's at in the pattern? The problem is many traders are not aware of those early signs. They don't see the problem until after they've made the mistake. What's the right expectations to see progress? The more aware you can be of situationally where this is likely to happen, we start to be able to create some probability. Well, that's very interesting because I know people are hearing this and they're like, I think I have FOMO, but now the way you just described that, how do you determine that it's not FOMO? Welcome back to the show, everyone. Today, I have a very special guest. He's the author of The Mental Game of Trading, Jared Tindler. Jared, I am so happy to bring you to the show, man. I read your book and I actually listened to it. And uh, when I listened to it, I was like, I got to bring this guy back because I'm a fan of Mark Douglas, as many traders know. And I always struggle finding someone, in my opinion, who is like up in that level. And I think I found him. So Jared, hey, man, I appreciate you being here, brother. High praise, Alex. I appreciate that very much. Good to see you. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. So before we dive into the mental side of trading completely, I'd like to at least get a scope of how, what got you into this world of trading and how you kind of transitioned from, I believe you started with golf, helping people in the mindset of golf, which is a lot of parallels. So if you could just take it away, kind of give us a scope of like how you started into here. For sure. Yeah. I mean, I wanted to play professional golf growing up. Um, you know, went to college, was a three-time All-American Division Three Skidmore, uh, played in four national championships, won nine tournaments. Um, so I get around, but I mean, you know, making that jump to playing professional is, is a jump. Um, 97, tried to qualify for the U.S. Open. There's two stages. Uh, basically played some of the, the best golf of my life, tee to green, but then just like kind of choked over the short putts, missed, play, missed a playoff by a shot to move on. You get the second stage of qualifying for the U.S. Open. It's basically like a, a modified PGA Tour event because – most of the slots in the, in the open are, um, you know, you have to qualify for it, right? There's not like kind of guaranteed spots. So you're playing up against like named PGA tour players, which would be super cool. Anyway. So you choke once you think it's a one-off and then, you know, it happened again later that summer trying to qualify for the U S amateur. And, you know, a friend of mine at the club, uh, gave me a book called uh, golf is not a game of perfect by Bob Rotella. Um, highly recommend. It's kind of the, uh, the Mark Douglas, you know, the, uh, trading the zone equivalent for golf, you know, kind of the OG there. So, um, you know, and it, it helped. I, 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 I kind of kept reading that and other material. And by and large, my game continued to rise, except under the bright lights of the biggest, you know, kind of pressure moments. So I kind of reasoned that golf psychology as it was, was kind of missing something. So I went and got a master's degree in counseling psychology, a license as a therapist. So I, I four years Right. Basically to kind of learn how to problem solve at a deeper level. And then once I got my license, quit my job in 2005, flew out to Arizona and started working with golfers to kind of combine sports psychology and therapy to create my own unique program and, you know, kind of build up a steady roster of clients. You know, some PGA Tour players had a gal one on the LPGA Tour shortly after we won some good junior players um, and, you know, it was just kind of building a roster. But it was still kind of tough to get people to work as hard as I wanted them to. You know, I think there's this like quick tip mentality mm. um, in golf, certainly back then it still, you know, exists a little bit in, in trading as well. Um, but ironically, I met a, a professional poker player who used to be a professional golfer. There was like a kind of a group trip we all met and um, he was having massive tilt issues. This was back in kind of the, uh, the, the glory days of online poker. Mm. He was playing 12 tables at once. And he was trying to uh, play a million hands of poker in in uh, 10 months to win this like kind of year long challenge. But he was having massive tilt issues. He was literally like, you know, punching his monitor, ripping out his desktop, slamming it in the, in the corner. And so he was struggling to get the volume in. He wasn't playing bad per se. He just couldn't, you know, get the volume in. So anyway, uh, in the in the months prior to he and I working together, he made, uh, you know, on average about 20K a month. In the four months after he and I worked together, he made 600 grand. So decent testimonial to kind of launch myself into professional poker. And ironically, I kind of solved my own mental game issues at this point. I started playing some mini tour events, had a weekend where I shot 60, 63, 66, 69. <laughs> and, you know, I kind of realized like something was very different. But I kind of had this, this choice point where like, I kind of dive into professional poker and you know, cause there was no Bob Rotella. There was no Mark Douglas in poker at that point. Like mm -hmm. I had open runway to create this new, 
endeavor, or I could spend, you know, around 250 grand over the next three years to try to play professional golf. So I kind of did it for a little, did both for a little while, but then realized like the safe bet there was actually continuing to coach poker players. So I did that for a while, wrote the mental game of poker, um, one in 2011, the second one in 2013. And right around the time the second one came out, I started hearing from a lot of traders who were picking up the poker book saying, look, if you change the word poker to trading, you've got another book. Um, that's not my style. That's not what the mental game of trading is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but, you know, I just started building up a roster of, of traders, um, you know, was getting invited to work on site, you know, with some institutional hedge funds and options firms. And um, yeah, just like kind of got into it and saw the parallels, saw the differences. But, uh, you know, for the most part, there's a lot of similarities between all three, you know, uh, industries. And yeah, then at least, you know, four years before I wrote the, the, the trading book, 2017, I started writing it. And then that came out uh, a couple of years ago now. So what year was it when you got into the field then of trading? Uh, around 2013. Okay, cool, cool. So so you've already worked with multiple traders one-on-one. -on -one. I know you also offer one-on-one -on -one coaching as well, which is really cool. I love that. So what I'd like to ask you right off the bat, because you mentioned there's a lot of similarities and there's also some differences. What are the differences that are not, that do not, you know, go across all, all of them across like golf, poker and trading. And you could just pick, you know, poker and trading since most people do understand those two similarities or you could do all three. It's up to you. Yeah. I mean, I think the, the difference is the biggest one for me is like just that the risk is way harder to define mm -hmm. in trading than it is uh, in poker, right? Mm -hmm. Poker's got 52 cards. You know what your risk is capped usually, right? When you buy in or you're playing in a tournament, um, but trading, right? You have to do a lot of other things on for yourself to really define the risk. The risk is not as well defined automatically. And so that's why risk management is essential. Now it is, it is still in poker, right? You've got, you got to have like bankroll management as they say there, yep. and you've got to still, you know, manage yourself. So you're not making big decisions a big mistakes in terms of how you're managing uh, your risk or managing your capital. But I think that's the biggest one. So there, as a trader, you have to independently be uh, a bit more um, like certain and defined around that because otherwise like y y you can make some very, very big mistakes. And I think that, you know, traders early on really underappreciate the, the necessity to define risk. Cause if not, then, then you can't really define, I think that that what you're doing isn't gambling. Now, both of these, environments can very easily kind of blend into that. But for me, gambling is defined as betting on a negative edge, right? The, there's always these sort of scales to how much risk you're willing to take. And you can take very high risk opportunities if that's how your entire strategy is set up and the risk is properly defined within that. Uh, and the same is true in poker. But I've had, you know, I've had a poker player who uh, decided to play heads up for his entire bankroll and lost. I had a poker player who played for an entire year uh, to build up a massive uh, bankroll and bet it all on Hillary Clinton to win the win the election. So, but they they both they both understood the risk and they took it and both are still in good spots now mm. because they were able to rec recover on the other side. Had they not understood what they were taking on, if they were not as emotionally sober, right? Which is what happens with a lot of traders, right? You they end up kind of taking on big risks because they're not realizing how emotionally compromised they are. And that becomes really sort of problematic on the other side. Hey, we wouldn't be able to do these face-to-face -face interviews if it wasn't for our sponsor, Cobra Trading. So if you can just give them a few seconds of your time, we'd really appreciate it. Cobra Trading is the go-to broker for day traders and short sellers. And I'm not the only one saying this. In fact, Benzinga awarded Cobra Trading as the go-to broker for short selling. They have a heavy focus on direct market access order routing, so you have the fastest execution. They have some of the best locate prices and availability. They also have amazing customer service. I've experienced many different brokers, and it's why I use them every single day and why I'm proud to have them as our sponsor. Sign up now by clicking the Be The Trader referral link below and earn one free month of software with Cobra and 25% off all commissions. Now let's get back to the show. So could, could you just tell us real quick, maybe one trader that stands out to you, it could be anyone, of just like a short story of how you help them, just so people who haven't read your book can kind of get an idea of how you kind of help someone? Yeah, so when somebody comes to me, they fill out a very detailed questionnaire. 
it's 80 questions long, but it's sort of a survey monkey kind of choose your own adventure based on what things they've said. But the purpose of that is so that when we start working together, I immediately kind of have a game plan, you know, for us to get started. So the questionnaire is assessing their goals, uh, you know, their underlying motivations, like kind of what really drives them, what their purpose is, what it's like when they're at their best. And then of course, what are the sort of common trading mistakes? And even though I'm not a trader, right, just like I'm not a poker player, although, you know, right. I had a home game, you know, this past weekend. Um, and I do, you know, kind of dabble in the markets, but nothing seriously like you all. I mean, um, but the, 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 it's really important to define the biggest trading mistakes that you make, because for the most part, those are where the underlying emotions or deeper kind of flaws in your sort of psyche and your mentality are going to be exposed, right? The repetitive mistakes that you make again and again, mm -hmm. that you know, you know better than, and it feels like a discipline issue. It feels like, you know, and, and there's a lot of self-criticism that comes in also because you, yes, you quote, yes. sort of should know better. But the reality is that emotions make you dumb mm. and emotions compromise your ability to think clearly, plan, make decisions. And so then at that moment, you are effectively kind of guaranteed to make some degree of a mistake, right? Even if it means you've got to like stop trading for that day or, or just like scratch the position and go for a walk. But the point is that we, we define those common trading mistakes. That's kind of the beginning access point for me to begin to understand where are at, what are the things that are kind of forcing that. So I'm assessing fear, anger, confidence issues, uh, greed, and discipline. But the discipline is at the end in part. Actually, the discipline is sort of intended to be at the end because you have to be able to determine that your violations of your rules, your system, your risk management, even your daily process, you have to be able to be certain that that's not being forced by some underlying emotional issue. Because mm -hmm. otherwise, it's not discipline. Your discipline can be broken down by the emotional system because discipline is a mental process. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be disciplined for things that are automatic, right? If you always wake up, brush your teeth, shower, go for a workout, do your pre-market prep, Right. If that stuff is like guaranteed, it never not happens. You don't need discipline there. Right. Discipline is needed where you're trying to improve, mm. where you're learning. And when that, you know, knowledge disappears, it's because the emotional system is hiding it. It brings you back to a more primitive state where you, you no longer have access to that. So those discipline issues are not discipline issues. And I, I'll get to your kind of the question. No, you're good. So we kind of look at all this and, you know, I think the, the classic one would be, you know, traders thinking that they've got a big issue with FOMO. And so one particular client, you know, this was, uh, so they kind of mentioned FOMO early on, right. In the sort of narrative story in the description of their problem. Um, and then as we kind of dig through and they start to get, you know, bracketed, well, it's like, it actually turned out to be far more of an anger issue. So it wasn't actually the fear that they were going to miss out on potential, you know, big uh, profits. It was the anger that was going to come because missing out felt like losing, felt like losing not only to the market, but to even other people that are kind of in their sphere of influence. Mm -hmm. And, and they hated to lose and they felt a deep sense of self-criticism you know, I'm kind of on top of that. And so they were jumping into positions prematurely out of fear of that anger. And, and once that was understood, well, then we kind of do, we go to battle, you know, understanding the source of that anger, the flaws they're in. Uh, and that was ultimately kind of how they were able to solve that particular problem. You know, that's very interesting because I know people are hearing this and they're like, I think I have FOMO, but now the way you just described that, like, how do you determine that it's not FOMO and that it is anger or that it is something completely different. Like how do you even map that out? And I kind of, <laughs> yeah. So, okay. I need you to... okay. yeah. so the, the, you, the way you start doing that, and because for me, the, there's only kind of one pure version of FOMO, which is that, yes, you can actually have a unconscious flaw that believes that this is the only opportunity you're going to get. Right. And it's, it's blinding. And logically, you know that that's not true, but emotionally, it feels like you have to take advantage. And this a lot of times happens for traders who are, you know, like trading part time, they've got a job and maybe they're, they're like, they've got like from eight to 9am to like make a trade. Otherwise, mm. 
they don't have, it's like, so they feel a lot of pressure to kind of get it done now because there is a actual kind of cap on their time and opportunity. Uh, but besides that, for the most part, you know, it really has to do with, I think like FOMO is more of an umbrella term and, and has to do with like the fear of losing, the hatred of losing, the fear of mistakes. There can be perfectionism involved. So to begin to kind of figure out like what is the underlying cause of that, you know, uh, FOMO, uh, just start taking some notes down about what's going through your mind at that time. You know, our, our thoughts can move very, very quickly and they can take on a, some, a somewhat of an unreal quality when they're just kind of rattling around inside of our heads. When you're forced to write them out, they A, will get clearer and B, you're, you're going to start to kind of find like the deeper layers, almost like kind of peeling back the onion a little bit. So, you know, and you can download this freely from my website. Uh, it's a data collection worksheet, right? And I talk about it in the book, kind of capturing the thoughts, the emotions, the physical signs, the changes in your decision-making process, mm -hmm. the specific types of positions that would trigger this reaction or the circumstances that would do that. And by capturing this data daily, right, as you go along, you're going to just learn more about this particular problem. And, and yeah, we're talking about FOMO, but you can do this for any, right? You could do it for revenge trading. You could do it for uh, overconfidence and greed. Uh, it doesn't matter what the emotional issue is. By gathering up this data, you then be able, you're, you then kind of have a better understanding of what is happening. And that is the beginning of being able to then figure out why it is happening, which comes second. But the other piece of this, right, as you kind of alluded to, was the mapping. So once you kind of collect all this data, you can start to see the escalation of the intensity of this because very often in, and actually the example I was giving with of this trader uh, in his a game, right? He is at his best. He will still have a thought to take a trade out of FOMO. Mm -hmm. So that is like the beginning of the pattern, right? It exists even when you're at your best. Now he's not going to succumb to it at that point because there's enough clarity, right? Enough strength in his mind to be disciplined. But as, you know, fatigue sets in or maybe a couple losses sets in and there's some kind of, you know, decline, well, now it becomes more of a battle. Sometimes he'll succumb, sometimes he won't. In the C game, when he's at his worst, then it's like, I mean, mm -hmm. as soon as that trigger happens, like the, the, you know, a very large position is being fired off, or at least it was before he and I worked. Uh, so, you know, being able to kind of see the, the, the degrading part of your mind or the increasing amount of emotion allows you to take action early because the emotional system will block your kind of higher brain function, right? Access to that, you know, knowledge that proves that what you're trying to do right now is not a good idea. Uh, and if you can catch it early, you have the opportunity to correct it early. But the problem is many traders are not aware of those early signs. They don't see the problem until after they've made the mistake, right? I had one of my early poker clients, didn't realize that he was on tilt until he had lost 10 buy-ins, right? $10,000 had to be burned before he was aware of tilt. And there are many traders the same way, right? They yep. don't realize they're on tilt until they have taken that fourth trade in a row, right? Having been pissed off that successfully they've been either stopped out by a tick or, you know, trade was sort of invalidated, but they keep trying because they're, you know, anchored and biased to their original thesis on, you know, price action for that day and movement for that day. So, you know, not realizing that there's that revenge trading happening until four, I mean, it's, it's dangerous. So we want to be able yep. to catch this early to get ahead of mistakes, not be reactive to them afterwards. You know, it's interesting that you said we want to catch them early, but then the thought comes to my head that, and I'm sure others think this way too, like if you can't catch it until like, like, are you saying, because emotions do take over and kind of turn off that higher functioning brain, the logical side, and then when the emotions take over, how can you still interrupt it no matter where it's at in the pattern is it because the level of intensity is lower at the beginning is that what you're saying yeah you you're you're you still retain more of that higher brain function right and okay. and right the ability to kind of talk against right to what i call injecting logic right some people might call it like a mantra or you know certain ways that you're talking to yourself that's how you correct the, those emotions right and keep them at a low enough level where you can stabilize yourself or at a minimum it's a, it's an opportunity to, to, to take a small break, right? Mm. Like, you know, take the pot of water off the stove for a second, let it just cool down a little bit. Right. And that that's, that's massive because there you're building in discipline around how you are managing and dealing with your emotions before you're able to actually, you know, ultimately correct them in the long term. 
Uh, but you said this too. You said uh, you said how you track things is important. Like your what your body's doing, how you're feeling, what you're thinking, what the action you're taking. Could you go into that a little bit more of like is this an example of of what you should be tracking? Because I know people are like, okay, uh, let me write down. You know, I keep on doubling my size, and they just like that's all I'm going to write down. Like, I know you're more specific. So yeah, situational, right? So I keep doubling my size. Like, in what situation do I have this impulse? Right. Be specific. Now, there's going to be a variety of situations, but the point is, like, the more aware you can be of situationally where this is likely to happen, we start to be able to create some probability. Hmm. Right. And that's what that's what we're kind of after here. By by taking actions early, we're not saying that you are guaranteed to avoid it. We're saying or or that is even going to happen. But we are saying that the probability of you going on tilt or you having FOMO increases when you're in when you have these situations. So right, writing them down is one. Number two, actually define the specific thoughts that come to mind. Right. Sometimes there might be no thoughts. And that's that's obviously very dangerous, right? To get into a position with no thoughts is but it happens, right? Yeah. Especially when the emotions are higher or where where you're, you know, kind of very highly impulsive. Um, but sometimes it might be a um uh, I am looking at Twitter, I'm looking in this chat group or room that I'm in, and I see a bunch of other traders in a position and I'm not, or I'm like reading, you know, like a pre-market prep from somebody else and realizing that, you know, something's out of sync and you know, I can hear, have thoughts of like, oh damn, like I'm, maybe I'm missing something. So there's like some self doubt yep. or there's a little bit of jealousy and kind of like now, now so those thoughts are, are another thing, but then, you know, typically emotions get felt in the body in some way, shape or form. We're not always aware of what they are, but you know, you might feel like constriction in the way that you're breathing, right? Might be more breathing through your mouth, kind of like <laughs> tensely in your chest. You might actually feel tension in your shoulders. Um, you know, when you're particularly angry, you might feel like like tension in your head. Maybe your hands get a little bit tighter on the mouse. Yep. You might notice yourself kind of scanning, you know, positions like more rapidly versus a sort of calm, you know, kind of steady. Maybe your, your feet are tapping, you're kind of leaned in, maybe you're checked out. I mean, there's like lots of sort of physical uh, examples of things that can be helpful in recognizing. And that's that's what this is all about. So it's yep. it's the recognition in real time, right? kind of like, like road signs, right? If you were driving down the, the road and, you know, all of a sudden you sort of start to become a little bit like on autopilot, like you want to have a road sign that says like, dude, you have gone off track, Yep. you know, and that's all we're doing here. So by, by capturing the data that I've described, uh, it helps you to sort of see like that something has gone wrong because a lot of times we don't, you know, traders don't realize it until, Right. There's like a bridge out on the road. Right. Like it's like, you know, stop. Yeah. They don't they just like drive right by it and like run their, you know, accounts off a cliff. Off like, the that's the extreme side of it. But it happens. And, you know, if you can't see it early and you, you won't be able to take action. So you also mentioned the whole idea of mental fatigue or like or it's just not as easy to catch things as time goes on. Like you're in an A game, you know, you might feel some FOMO, but you're not going to react to it. Any suggestions to stay in that like a game to like reduce mental fatigue? I mean, if you are trading full time and you're staring at charts all day like that, and especially if you are, let's say, like kind of less than five years at this, mm -hmm. you know, fatigue is far less of an issue for traders that have been doing this for 25, 30 years because there's so much that is automated for them, so much that is unconscious. They don't have to think about. But when you're staring at charts all day, especially if you're in a lot of positions, the amount of stress that's involved, the amount of mental activity that's involved is tiring. Uh, and, and if you have the aspiration to be trading at a high level for, you know, six, eight hours a day, then you need to have better management of that time. Now, you know, this is harder if you're trading on a 30 second or one minute chart. But if you're trading at a minimum on a five minute chart, like you have the opportunity to take like a three minute break at least once an hour, if not multiple times an hour. Stand up, go for a walk, just just give yourself a chance to just like let things simmer down for a minute. Don't bring your phone, step outside, get some fresh air, do some push-ups, close your eyes for two minutes, set an alarm if you need to. But it's just like kind of giving your chance yourself a chance to kind of step away reduces what I would call a very hidden cause of fatigue, which is what I call accumulated data or bloated brain. Mm -hmm. So imagine you're a sponge. 
right? Absorbing data, right? Which is what's happening. Yep. Well, at a certain point, that sponge is going to get saturated, right? It cannot hold anymore. And that's like the extreme of bloated brain. Mm. And so if you're steadily throughout the day, just squeezing a little bit of water out because you're letting your mind simmer, stop the absorption, right? And it, you have like that little reset. Now, upon reset, I think it's really helpful to reconnect either to your thesis on the day, something kind of technical and like your long-term goals with trading just to give you that extra focus. And if you do that, it's like a, like a very kind of mini, what I call a kind of like a reset. It can happen within three minutes, even sometimes shorter. Um, you do that five, six, seven, eight times a day, not to mention maybe bathroom breaks and, you know, some food, like you will have better energy longer because you're just managing it. But traders, it's so easy to get sucked in and not have that kind of rigidity with your discipline a, because they're more committed to making trades than they are to making their best trades. Mm. And that's a small difference, but it's massive when you actually think about it. Oh, yeah, it's huge. I mean, the, most of the traders I interview, I've interviewed oh, easily probably over 100 traders. They make their year sometimes in one trade, sometimes in three trades, sometimes in a week. Or, or, so it's like very common that just go for the best. So I'm glad you said that and showed people how a way to reset. You have two other concepts that, that really intrigued me. One of them was, and it might be similar, but one of them is, uh, you know, you have your A game, your B game, and your C game. And I love that you said it in your book that you're, you can only be, I, I might butcher this, as good as, you, as your C game or something like that. Could you explain that? Because that really shed light for me. Yeah, I think, so the idea is that you can only guarantee your C game. Okay. You have to earn your B and A game right? Because your C game is you at your worst. And I'm not saying that that's what is expected of you day in and day out. Okay. What I'm saying is that you're able to earn your A game and, and B game by getting good rest, by eating, hydrating, exercising, whatever you're doing to kind of take care of yourself, like, like an athlete would, right? Like, yep. what is it? all of that helps you to automatically like be at a higher level. But, you know, the only thing you can truly guarantee is your absolute worst because that's what comes easy and automatically. All of us can show up and be our worst easily, but to earn more requires what? Now, especially on a mental and emotional front, right? A lot of the mapping we've just discussed and how to be more precise and how you're managing yourself emotionally and physically throughout the trading day. So it's it's not just about like kind of what you're getting at the start, but what you're getting over the, the entire, the, to, to, the totality of your trading day and really, you're probably your trading week, maybe even your trading month, right? Because it's just so easy for traders to get so caught up in, I need to be here trading at all times versus I need to be here at my best as much as I possibly can. And when I'm not, it's okay to take breaks. And over time, like, let's minimize the frequency with which we need to do it from a mental and emotional standpoint, right? Because not, there's nothing worse than, you know, realizing like, you're just you know, kind of effed in the head and you just, you should not trade. And then now it feels doubly worse. Now you feel bad because of whatever's going on and you feel bad because you're not doing what you're mm -hmm. supposed to be doing. Yeah. And that's brutal. Like, so there's ways of kind of curbing and correcting that. But like right now we all have a C game that is given to us and it's our job to learn how to move that progressively forward in what I call sucking less, right? When you have opportunities to suck, if you suck just a little bit less, that's progress. And I know it doesn't feel like progress because we want to be at our best all the time. Right. But that concept is flawed. The best traders in the world have weakness, right? They've got a C game. Now, yep. that C game might be many levels above your A game. True. But yep. that's irrelevant, right? The idea, though, is that for you to get there, it's not going to come just because your A game gets to that level. It's going to come because you also move your C game. Mm -hmm. And that is a commonality across all performance environments, right? We got the Super Bowl coming up in a week. You know, you go to the World Series of Poker, right? I mean, trading doesn't have the equivalent of that, but every day we could say is kind of that. For you to be successful, anybody in that environment, first and foremost, it is a battle to see who has the strongest C game. Mm. Because when your C game is really strong, you remove a lot of pressure. You know you're not going to beat yourself. You know there's a level of stability that is there. 
And it becomes a lot easier for you to be at your best and be in the zone mm. because of the strength of that. And then the natural inherent pressure of the environment is going to draw it out of you. So for traders day in and day out, like what's going to define your best trading are those days, right? Where you're able to have a really, really strong C game, be prepared to do battle against that. And then your A game just sort of naturally can happen more and more as you know, your motivation and the clarity of mind and that emotional stability allows it to happen. You know, you also said the inchworm concept and, and I might, I'm curious if this question kind of go, you know, makes sense with that concept of what should be the right expectations of traders who are listening to this? Maybe they read your book, maybe they've got some coaching, right? And what's the right expectations to see progress in their growth of a C game? Because, you know, I don't want traders to be like, man, I've been working on this for a day. I don't see progress. This sucks. It's not working. You know, I'm being dramatic here, but I just want to ask you in general, what would you suggest? In general, have no expectations because they, they are implied guarantees and that's what makes them so dangerous, right? When you expect something to happen, you're basically saying, I guarantee this will happen. Mm. But that's the, that's the implicit um, intent by that idea. So, uh, you know, we don't know how complicated some of these issues are. Sometimes they're very simple. Sometimes, you know, what seems simple on the surface as we dig down becomes far more complicated. And that's just sort of the inherent nature of this is we're kind of digging through our, you know, our psyche. Sometimes it like, you know, wormholes into stuff in our childhood. And yep. it's like, well, and then that's, that's kind of some of the cool parts about trading really for any performance, right? It does give us an opportunity to kind of better ourselves. Right. And that's what, that's one of the things I love about golf for myself, right? I'm continually being faced with myself out there and seeing where my own weak, my weak points are. And so I don't have expectations about how fast I'm going to be able to correct something. My expectations are more of around my activity in pursuit of that improvement, mm. right? The actual outcomes are tough to predict because we don't know, right? Sometimes there's, you know, big steps forward and then you kind of find like a new landmine that just, you know, couldn't have been seen before, right? I mean, to give you a, a kind of a parallel, you know, I've been starting to lift a lot heavier as I try to build up for, a, you know, big golf season coming up and started experiencing knee pain, okay? But the knee pain was a symptom of like a lot of tightness in my quads. Tried massage, tried Cairo, turns out acupuncture was the way to get it through. A couple of weeks later, you know, knee is much better and I'm lifting heavier than ever. So like those kind of unexpected setbacks, you know, are oftentimes a, um, hmm. a gift yeah. of being, of progress, right? That's yeah. why there's always a C game because you, you don't know like what, what's going to kind of cause that next limitation. So I think it's really important when we're talking about mental and emotional improvement, really even trading improvement, that you're open-minded and really, really diligent about catching any of the flaws, any of the, the weaknesses that pop up as you're progressing and take care of them fast. Cause like in years past, I would have, I would have definitely done some serious damage to my knee because I would have ignored the signals of the pain. I was like, Oh, it's not that big a deal. Right. But no, it's like, it's happening for a reason. And the signal is very often not the problem, right? Uh, Especially okay. with our bodies, right? The knee pain was not the problem. The knee pain was a signal of the, the extreme tightness in my quads. And as it turns out, a little bit of, you know, kind of lack of perfect, um, you know, movement in some of the exercise I was doing. But th I think that, that, that kind of thesis is much better. Than that, that completely relates to trading. I mean, like, like you said er, way early in the conversation, you might think it's FOMO. You might, because you double down a bet, like that's the signal. That's one of the signals. Signal. It doesn't mean that was the reason that wasn't the cause of your pain in your case, but in the double down bet. Exactly. Now, I, I know people are going to have tons of questions for you and, and I'm going to want to bring you back because I, I'm just like, <laughs> Jesus, I want to ask so many more questions. So I, I'm going to stretch this out a little more because I want to ask you a couple more things. And okay. What have you found has been the most, and if there is, if there's not, that's fine. But what have you found to be the most common either, either issue that people come to you with and, and or they assume it's the issue and it never is? I'll say this kind of in two ways. Expectations are by far the most common. Okay. Um, and I'd say, especially for traders, you know, I've worked with, especially in the last couple of years since the book came out, I've worked with a lot of traders kind of more on the junior side, you know, kind of less than five years. Uh, 
And different than poker, right? Poker players, a lot of the ones that were my, my clients, they kind of got into this very young. Most traders that I work with have another job right now, or they're like transitioning, or they're sort of newly, you know, kind of full time. And it's so easy to not really appreciate how much you should expect losing to occur and to really kind of understand the competitive landscape, which is why I always recommend people to read Trading in the Zone, because Douglas does a phenomenal job of really educating the environment of trading and, and understanding the probabilistic nature of it and how to begin kind of tackling it from that perspective. Uh, so your, your kind of expectations of yourself and expectations of like what trading should be, you know, intellectually you may have, but have you been able to truly embrace it at a very deep level? So yes. it's more instinctive is the question. And a lot of times, you know, you, if you have an underlying flaw, for example, like the hatred of losing, right. And this is something that's gone on for years of, you know, it wasn't just in trading that this came out. It's like, you hated losing when you were a kid and like, it was fine and funny, but now that hatred of losing is actually blocking you from being able to truly accept at a deep level the probabilistic nature of trading because when you lose, it, like it causes the same kind of pain. Yep. Right. Perfectionist, a massive other problem, right? Having high expectations of yourself, hmm. right? And the kind of precision with which you expect to do is oftentimes matched by this sort of high standard, like I should always be at my best. And as we've already described, like that is impossible unless you are only trading for 10, 15 minutes a day. I think it's impossible to be at your best at all time, right? If you, it's gotta be, so there's gotta be times where you're gonna deviate. And, and when that happens, it's actually an opportunity to again, suck less at any point, um, to better understand, right? Kind of the, the, the weaknesses or flaws that are pulling you down and correcting them. But that's a constant. So you need to have a process, right? Which is why I built a system this. You need a system or a process to be able to dissect problems, period, not just the specific ones you're facing now. Because that's, that's kind of, the, I think, the kind of the cool thing of using the book is that you not only get to solve like the current issues of, let's say, FOMO and revenge, but you learn the system to then be able to do that again in the future. Because mm. the system is sort of agnostic to the problem specific that you're dealing with. It's one that you can use repetitively throughout, you know, your trading career. So long story short, yes, expectations, perfectionism, it's super, super common. And sometimes it comes because, right, you've been successful elsewhere and now yep. you have to become an infant again. It's so hard for people to bumble around like an infant when like, oh, well, I, you know, I, I know I shouldn't expect this level, but I shouldn't expect to like have to start, you know, at ground zero. And it's yep. like, but you do, <laughs> maybe you'll be able to, maybe you'll be able to progress faster because of the independent skills that you learned here. But the knowledge and the process and very likely the landscape is so wildly different that it's, it's actually not like all of your past experience is not only not going to help you, it might be hurting you because you have built in beliefs and expectations about how to achieve success. And in trading, it might be fundamentally different. And it's so interesting. Like I, I have found like most people who are pursuing trading, they do have, like you say, they're leaving a career. I left a career and, you know, you got to have some type of income or some type of success outside of trading to even be looking at trading for the most part for like the majority of people and so like they have success outside at the real world if you will and then they come to trading and they can't accept they failure yeah yeah, yeah yeah easily at all and the other thing is in the real world you're not hit with your failures every minute you know you're hit with your failures you might do something today and then three years later you finally remember or at the end of the year like oh i that's why this happened. That was dumb. Yep. Whereas in trading, you're hit with it. If you're trading on the minute chart, you're hit with it every time, you know, or the, the four hour. It's just very, you're just hit constantly. So. And to know that those aren't failures, right? That's the, that's the whole point. It's like, they're not, if you're executing properly, they're not failures, but that mm. doesn't feel that way, right? Because yes. you're so used to getting rewarded or feed or, you know, proper feedback. In a, or you're used to getting paid for the hours you put in. Like right. that, that itself is is such a dynamic. So before we start to wrap this up, because I, I know people are going to have questions for you and they're going to learn more about you. So I want to give you time at the end of this to, sh to share where they can find more out. But I did ask my Discord group if they had any questions for you. And I had a couple of questions for you real quick. So you mind if I ask you that real quick? Yeah, of course. All right. Awesome. So I have a question from Mary Lou. And Mary, thank you for asking this. She said, do you have any tips on coming back from a big loss? Write about it. 
Um, the, the scar tissue can build up pretty quickly around those, um, especially when you let those emotions kind of ruminate in your mind. But like do just a kind of a big, like kind of emotional just journal, right? Just dump it all out on paper. Do not let your mind be the one that is only processing it. And once you kind of get that part out, it's almost like the stages of grieving, right? It's like a little shock and denial at first. We're going to crack through that and be like, no, we're going to rip this freaking wound off, right? rip the bandaid off and see the wound for what it is. Yep. Then you have to start looking more surgically at, okay, why did this happen? And it could be both from a mental and a technical standpoint. What were the mistakes? What led to this? What did I miss that, you know, maybe I can kind of look for in the future? Um, was this a one-off? Is this going to be a repetitive problem? Because there's a, like, you can get past it very, very quickly when you've learned a lot from it. Mm. Most often these past losses, blown accounts, big mistakes stick with us because there's a lot left to learn that we weren't on actively doing, right? we kind of trusting that we're naturally going to learn from it or it's the classic well let me just forget about it and move on yeah but like that that's highly inefficient because you are pretty much guaranteed to make some version of that mistake again because typically the bigger the mistake bigger the failure the bigger the, the loss the bigger the lesson and you might only naturally be able to pick up like one or two pieces and we don't want it to be like a counter reaction like oh, don't do that, right? Usually it's far more sophisticated, right? So that you're like really kind of upgrading your mental or technical processes. And that's different than just a hard, like, don't do that. Yep. And that's like the lazy way out. I've done it sure. where you just like make a mistake, like, okay, I won't do that again. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, it's also the overconfident way because the reality is, you can't guarantee that you're not going to do that again. And, and if you do, then there's going to be a lot of self-criticism and that's where the repetitive mistakes come in. And um, yeah, it's, it's going to be particularly problematic. I appreciate you answer that for Mary. Jared, I have another question from uh, another person on our Discord channel, Jan. Jan is saying, if there is a step-by-step -step morning process that helps center a person's emotions and mental clarity control, do you have anything like that? Yeah, so there's kind of two big issues that I think traders experience as far as pre-market prep. Number one is that they kind of bring in baggage from the day or bring in baggage from like the personal life. So if that's happening, ideally like an hour before the trading day, you'd spend up to 15 minutes, like 10 to 15 minutes, just kind of like writing about maybe tasks or like lingering ideas or emotions that are on your kind of mind or that you're feeling related to anything personal. And at the end of those 10 or 15 minutes, you kind of draw like a proverbial line in your mind and just say like, all right, that is a way I like literally physically away. Are you going to kind of put the document away? But also mentally, you're giving yourself the freedom to kind of have a vacation from that. Because a lot of times having a break actually helps us to interface with those issues better. Mm. Right. So it's okay to have the break. Now, maybe there's something that can kind of pop up during the trading day. You might, you know, need to be available for That's fine. But when that does happen, same thing again, just say, all right, not now that's a way. Now I get to have the freedom to focus on trading. Awesome. As far as like the pre-market prep part, you absolutely need to have, I mean, forget like the kind of the technical side of it, because there's, there's a lot that, you know, kind of variation there, but you need to have clarity on what you're trying to do technically and at, like from at the beginning, because like any athlete going to compete, like nobody, you know, this past weekend in the NFC, Cham or NFC and AFC championship games, like they had so much preparation from a, a strategic standpoint for what they're doing. Right. That like come game day, there's no questions about what they're trying to do. Right. So you want to have that kind of clarity day in and day out on a trading side, but then also on a mental and emotional side. Right. What are you battling? What are you dealing with? What are you trying to help yourself navigate so you can be at your A game more often and, you know, certainly suck less when your C game shows up. So having that clarity there is really important. And then lastly, I want you to review your goals mm -hmm. so you can kind of keep the bigger picture in mind. It's so easy to get kind of caught up and swept up in the day and lose sight of what you're trying to do this month, this quarter, this year. 100%. And and I have another one from Vindictory. Vindictory. Sorry, Vin. He was saying, what are some common misconceptions traders have about mental or emotional obstacles or how they try to manage them? Yeah, and it's all in the question, right? So they they believe that management and control is the, like kind of the holy grail. Like that's the end outcome. And, you know, like my knee pain, right? Like, yeah, 
the 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 answer right mentally and emotionally is oh well i just have to like you know put some wrap on my knee or like do things to protect it uh maybe take more days off like there's this sort of manipulation management versus no no, no. solve the freaking issues this is like actually solve the source and the cause of your fomo right solve the source mm-hmm. and the cause of your revenge trading your hatred of losing your overconfidence then you don't need to rely on management and your mind is freed up to purely focus on trading well. That's what we want, right? When you have to segment a portion of your brain to be aware of and defend against your internal impulses for you know some kind of emotional bad behavior, there's no way that you can be as purely unbiasedly focused on the markets as you want to be, right? Yeah. And that's when you're going to be in the zone. So, you know, the biggest flaw is just the way that they even conceive of problem solving. We are not trying to manage, overcome, right? Your emotional issues. We're trying to solve them. Now in the short term, yes, we do need to manage and and control them, but that has to be used as a strategy as part of the long-term goal of solving them at a deep level, which I understand is is more complicated, but to truly resolve an emotional problem, right? Just takes more work. But the, the upside is way bigger. And the way I would just kind of describe this is we've all kind of had arguments with friends or spouses or, you know, close. Yep. And like when there's that argument, there's like palatable tension, right? Your relationship is compromised in some way. But when you talk through it, work through it, ideally, the relationship is stronger yep. for it, right? That's like the growth through. And so you're always going to have these sort of internal conflicts with yourself as you're dealing in a high performance environment that is trading. And when you clean up that crap, you are freer, you are stronger. That's what we want. That's how you're going to continue to level up. Well, look, Jared, I already know I want to talk to you again in the future. If people want to learn more about you, where can they learn about that? Go ahead and let us know. Yeah. So jaredtendler.com, my website, I've got some free resources, the worksheets I've mentioned that go along with the mental image trading, uh, as well as a, a, a free ebook on intuition, right? And how to be able to access that and use it more. Um, I've got, you know, kind of freely available on Twitter um, at Jared Tendler. Uh, but I also have a, you know, besides the book, I've got a, a new program called the Mental Game of Trading Live. So it is my community now where I can do kind of like, we'll say kind of like individual coaching in a group environment, right? Oh, it's cool. Very kind of personalized. It's kind of help you working through my system. Uh, and, and you know, it's like kind of a big, it's, you know, growing community. It's been going for about uh, four months now. Awesome, Jared. Well, look, brother, I appreciate you so much for joining us today and sharing our knowledge, my man. I think, thank you again, man. Thanks, Alex. Appreciate it, man.